evening, everyone. You're all very welcome. Uh, my name is Eve Patton, and I'm director of the Trinity Long Room Hub, which is Trinity College's Arts and Humanities Research Institute. This is the second year that the Trinity Long Room Hub has collaborated with our colleagues in creative arts practice and in neuroscience for Creative Brain Week. It's been an absolutely tremendous series of events so far this week. So let me begin by congratulating the organizers of the Creative Brain series of events. Uh, and we come this evening to uh, a subject um, that's very close to our hearts in the arts and humanities, the role of the imagination and the imagination uh, as part of, as a function of the creative brain and the role of the imagination, particularly in relation to the kind of neurological states and conditions that uh, many of us have been looking at already this week. How do we find a language for imaginary worlds? Our speaker this evening is Professor Cindy Weinstein, and I'm very pleased to welcome her. Cindy is the Eli and Edith Blythe Broad Professor of English at California Institute of Technology. She's a lecturer in American literature and the author of many books, particularly on 19th century fiction. She's a specialist in the work of the author Herman Melville. Uh, but this evening, uh, we're going to talk a little bit in relation to her most recent book, um, which comes to a topic, uh, I think, right at the heart of some of the interests of our Creative Brain Week. Uh, this book is co-written with Dr. Bruce Miller of the University of California at San Francisco, and it's called Finding the Right Words, A Story of Literature, Grief and the Brain. How do the arts, how does the imagination provide a resource for dealing with difficult conditions and particularly conditions such as that experienced by Cindy with her father's diagnosis of early onset Alzheimer's? I'm very pleased to welcome Cindy again and to hand over to her for this evening's discussion. Cindy. Thank you, Eve. Thank you so much, uh, Creative Brain Week. Trinity University, Eve, Christina, Elsbeth for inviting me to uh, participate in this event that is so near and dear to my heart. A uh, special thanks to Dominic Campbell, uh, California Institute of Technology, the Alzheimer's Association, the Global Brain Health Institute, and my daughter, Sarah Weinstein, who helped with the slides. The title of my presentation tonight is The Language of Imaginary Worlds, Alzheimer's. Um, next slide, please. Wonderful, thank you. Um, this is a picture of my parents, Jerry Weinstein and Sip Weinstein on their honeymoon uh, at Niagara Falls. Um, and the book I wrote is about my father, Jerry Weinstein, and uh, he was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's uh, with the logopenic variant. And I'll explain a little bit more about that. And um, the book was a labor of love and also honors my mother, who was my father's primary caregiver. Next slide, please. I thought I would begin uh, by reading a portion of uh, a, a chapter. It's uh, the chapter on memory. And I thought a chapter on memory was going to be the first chapter. I studied neurology for a year at UCSF with my co-author, Dr. Bruce Miller, and the many amazing psychologists, geriatricians, neuro, psychologists at UCSF. And when I began my study of neurology and dementia, I was under the um, uh, misunderstanding that dementia was only about memory. It turned out that memory became the last chapter of my book. And I think this will give you um, a, a flavor of my voice and um, sort of my 
um, integration of neurology and science. My dad worked incredibly hard. When I was little, he went to the office six days a week. And then as Apex Electrical Supply took off, the business he owned with my mother's brother, he worked five days a week and then four and a half so he could golf on Friday afternoons. I used to love going with him to the office and typing on the wide girth electric typewriter or answering the phone, Apex Electrical Supply, may I help you? Best of all though, was getting to ride in the grimy van with him when he was delivering cables, wires, whatever. In those days, there weren't minivans or SUVs, so being in an elevated seat high up on the road counted as a novel experience, as fun. He liked to bowl and dance. His bowling day was Thursday, my mom's Monday. They liked to go dancing at the Meadowbrook Ballroom in Cedar Grove, the town next to Verona. At every bar or bat mitzvah, he would try to teach me how to dance. He liked Robert Goulet, who starred in a 1960s Broadway show called The Fantastic, and sang dad's favorite song, which was Try to Remember. Talk about foreshadowing. He also loved Cat Stevens' album, Tea for the Tillerman, and Roberta Flack's The First Time Ever I Saw Your Face. He wasn't materialistic, but he loved his Mavada watch, a birthday present from my mother, no numbers, black face, and a diamond where the 12 would have been. He used to tell me I was afraid of my own shadow, and he was right. Drying to death in a Maytag mag machine wasn't the only example. Here's a list. The dark clowns, dolls coming to life. A Twilight Zone episode that I saw in Florida that scared the shit out of me for life. The Wicked Witch of the West, her skin, her laugh, the monkeys. My third grade teacher, who was mean and sent me home from school because she said the gray and beige checked hot pants I was wearing, which my mother had bought me as a birthday present, were too short. The first time I saw my Nana without her dentures, I didn't know she wore dentures, terrified me. Her face was disfigured, wizened, collapsed in on itself. Speaking of teeth, I recall my father going to the dentist and consistently refusing Novocaine. The dentist would try to change my dad's mind by telling him how much the procedure was going to hurt, but dad wouldn't be swayed. I don't think it was entirely about being macho, though he definitely relished narrating the pain and the sound of the drill, all while not under the influence. He would say that he preferred the pain to the numbness. Here's more. He had an aqua dodge dart and he loved it because it lasted forever. Years later, he bought a dodge swinger, brown body, cream colored roof and hated it. That's when I first learned that the word lemon could be applied to cars. He also hated raisins, which upset my grandma Sarah because she liked to make rugula, a bite-sized Jewish dessert, with them. He loved grandma Sarah so much that when he went on a golfing vacation with some of his friends to Bermuda, he took time out of the short trip to visit her in Miami. I remember him saying how happy he was that he had done this because it was the last time he saw her before she died. Dad was like this. He took good, he took care of people. He made sure my brother knew how much he was loved, even while he was becoming a Buddhist. He made sure that my sister got a dog after my uncle retracted on a promise to give her one from his friend's litter. I think he bought Taka and brought him home the day of my uncle's betrayal or the next. The first time I saw my father cry was when he came home from the veterinarian having put down Taka, our beloved dog of 13 years. I don't think I ever saw him cry about having Alzheimer's, at least I don't remember but maybe I'm blocking it out. He loved my mother so much that when he got sick, she loved him back with all she had. And he loved me in ways big and small, in ways that make it necessary for me to write this book for him. Next slide. I had an idea for writing a book about my father's early onset Alzheimer's. I had this idea for quite a while and it took me many years to find my co-author, Dr. Bruce Miller, who uh, founded the Memory and Aging Center at the University of California at San Francisco. I wanted to write a book with a neurologist uh, because I wanted the book to help readers um, both by explaining the complexities of my own grief process and how I use literature and my imagination to make sense of what my father was going through and what my family was going through. But I knew I needed uh, a neurologist, maybe even a doctor who could 
help explain the neurology behind the clinical presentations that had made such a deep and lasting impression on me. And so I found Bruce and we shared many goals for the book that we would write together. We were both committed to an interdisciplinary crossover, uh, what E.P. Snow described as a meeting of the two cultures. We both wanted to make the science accessible. I knew for my part that it was essential to find humor wherever possible in the tragedy that I described. And I really wanted to share my story, as I said, in order to help other people who might be going through the experience. And I knew that my father would have wanted me to do that as well. I didn't know that in the process I would recover um, many memories of my own. Um, and the section that I just read, as I said, is from the memory chapter of the book. And what I realized in writing that chapter was that I hadn't forgotten happy memories of my father, but I had stored them away because it was too difficult to remember the happy memories. Um, in many ways, my memory began the day my father was diagnosed and the power and awfulness of that diagnosis wiped out much that happened before. And in the process of writing the book and finding the right words, I was able to access these very precious memories, very happy memories of my father. Bruce too wanted to reach a general audience. He's an incredible writer and had an interest in pursuing his love of creative writing. He too was committed to sharing his expertise um, and bringing the arts and sciences together. He wanted to um, also highlight the importance of empathy. And I'll talk a little bit about that and sort of the role of narrative medicine in the creation of our book. Um, and he wanted to make the neurology as accessible as possible. Next slide, please. The challenges uh, for me, um, remembering some of the extremely difficult um, uh, clinical presentations of my father, it wasn't that it was hard to remember them. I remembered them quite well, but responding to them and coming to terms with them was another matter. As I said, finding a co-author was challenging. It probably took about a decade to find Bruce. There were a couple of neurologists that I spoke with along the way who were interested in writing the book with me, but did not have um, the time to do so. And also, and I'll talk about this a little bit, the book structure was a challenge. It's an unusual structure. It's, it's a dual memoir. Um, written with someone, i.e. Bruce, who never knew my father. My father died um, in the 2000s, and uh, we didn't have PET scans. We didn't have MRIs. He was diagnosed in 1985. And it was only through Bruce's tremendous act of empathy uh, that he was able to know my father. For Bruce, finding the time to write was extremely challenging. Um, I wanted him to um, not quite meet me halfway in terms of uh, humanistic writing, uh, but I, I encouraged him to write in a more personal way. And I think one of the other narratives that's going on in the book is my friendship with Bruce. And uh, he tells some very powerful stories about his father, his grandfather, his grandchildren, and um, Bruce Miller, the person, really comes through uh, in the sections that he wrote. And also, not knowing my father, he only came to know my father through my memories and through an incredible act of empathy and deep listening. Next slide, please. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but um, Rita uh, Charon uh, is 
the founder of a field that many of you may be familiar with, uh, narrative medicine. And in 2001, in the Journal of the um, American Medical Association, wrote a pioneering essay outlining some of the contours of narrative medicine. And she calls attention to four of medicine central narrative situations, the physician and the patient, the physician and the self, physician and colleagues, and physicians and society. And for, um, for Rita, um, who also got a PhD in English, as well as an MD, um, the tools of close reading that English professors uh, are experts in are incredibly valuable for physicians. And she talks about um, bridging the divides that separate phys physicians from patients, themselves, colleagues, and society. Narrative medicine offers fresh opportunities for respectful, empathic, and nourishing medical care. And one of the primary ways that narrative medicine does this is through storytelling. Next slide, please. Uh, the narrative of dementia is an interesting intellectual problem, as it were. When I was writing my sections of Finding the Right Words, Bruce kept asking me what the initial, what the initial symptom was, and that chronology is just so important for precision diagnosis, because if the doctor knows what happened when. Um, the doctor can also know where in the brain the initial assault takes place, and then interventions can occur with that information in hand. And I was able to explain to Bruce that um, my father's initial uh, presentations were depression and word finding. When my dad was diagnosed in the 80s, it was Alzheimer's. Everything was Alzheimer's. We didn't have the kind of precision diagnosis that we have now. And it was through conversations with Bruce um, that I learned the true diagnosis was early onset. My dad got sick in his 50s. Early onset Alzheimer's with the logopenic variant. And the logopenic variant means the word finding was um, one of the first problems. And a reason that I needed to write the book was the terrible synchronicity of becoming an English professor, studying literature at Berkeley and accumulating as much language and as many words as I possibly could at the same time as my father was losing language. Um, that was something I needed to look at and understand. And so there was a tension for me between sort of the imperative to tell Bruce um, a chronological version of my father's illness, but grief is not chronological. And so there was, um, I think, probably a productive tension between the importance of chronology um, from a medical point of view um, and the importance of anti-chronology from the point of view of explaining to readers my grief process. Next, next slide. Um, I'm just gonna read a two more um, excerpts from the book. This one is from a chapter on spatial disorientation. It's called Lost in Space. Dad had a lot of friends when he could play and remember where he was, but people can only withstand witnessing so much dissolution and suffering before they jump ship. Invitations to play golf, to play cards, to go out to dinner as a couple started drying up. My mother couldn't understand why. She finally found out one day when she innocently asked one of dad's golf partners why he hadn't been playing much lately. He replied that he had been playing and then explained the reason for my father being excluded 
bottom line, the men couldn't take it anymore. Apparently, there had been difficulties for a while. My mother didn't go into details, perhaps because my dad's friend didn't, perhaps because she wanted to spare me. But the straw that broke the camel's back for the group of men with whom my dad had been playing golf for decades was the following. He had the golf club in hand, ready to swing for the fences, except he was quite literally swinging for and at the fences. In other words, he was aiming away from the putting green, positioning himself in the exact wrong direction. One of the men in the group gently turned my father's body around, correcting the error, helping my dad to finish the round, the last round he would play. That's it. That's the memory which combines kindness and cruelty in a way that I've never been able to put my finger on. Maybe because everyone in the memory does the best they can, but that does nothing to change the awful result. The kindness lies in the act of an older man gently. I remember that was the word my mother used, putting his hands around my father's waist. Okay, I'm inventing here. And wordlessly turning him around so he could take the swing. The man would do this one kind thing and never more, no relation to never more in Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven, put himself in a situation where he'd have to do it again. When my mother told me about this over the phone, I cursed up a blue streak and then signed up to take golf lessons at a driving range not far from the Berkeley campus. I have slightly more sympathy for dad's golf partners now than at the time. I think they were frightened that somehow dad's illness was catching. Plus, they were men in their 60s, born in the 20s, and not your typical caregiving population. If they wouldn't play golf with dad because his illness was interfering with their good time, I'd pick up the slack somehow. I would do that from the other side of the country while teaching a composition class and writing my dissertation and somehow learning to play golf 3,000 miles away from my father translated into playing golf with my father. Next slide, please. I'm not going to read this, but um, this will just give you a flavor of the back and forth between me and Bruce. Um, so I tell this story in a chapter about space and then Bruce talks about how the brain understands space. Um, and he does a brilliant job explaining sort of the complexities of the neurological network and what it means when someone goes out for a drive and it should be a 10 minute errand and it turns into a two hour one. What's happening in the brain that the person is losing their spatial anchoring. And Bruce responds to this particular anecdote that I tell um, with, um, with passion and empathy and basically tells readers that this was a missed opportunity uh, from the point of view of the friends, that it was a chance to be empathic toward my father and the friends um, missed out on something really important and um, uh, this is, I think, a really good and painful example of the role of stigma in dementia, which um, is uh, very painful, not only for the person with dementia, but for the caregiver as well. Next slide, please. So um, I am working on another uh, writing project that thinks about uh, dementia in relation to um, art and poetry. And I am especially taken with um, the surrealist school of painting. And uh, I think Magritte is a very interesting example of an artist who unintentionally, I'm sure, captures um, aspects of a semantic difficulties that people with dementia experience. They can't access the word. And um, the La Clé de Songe on the left-hand side, I think really um, illustrates uh, some of the things we know about aphasia. Um, and then on the right is Dolly's famous melting clock um, image. And I um, am interested in how dementia uh, problematizes um, one's relation to temporality. And I think this artwork uh, really captures that. And as I said, unintentionally, but, um, but very accurately, uncannily accurately. Uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, I'm also very interested in Emily Dickinson. Uh, some of her poems on the brain are just such amazing predictors of how we think about the brain. And there are many neurologists I know, including Bruce and Ken Kosick, uh, who are quite interested in Dickinson's poetry. Um, this is the brain is wider than the sky. I won't, I won't read it. Um, uh, can we have the next slide, please? Here's another uh, poem, uh, the brain within its groove runs evenly and true, but let a splinter swerve toward easier for you to put a current back when floods have slit the hills and scooped a turnpike for themselves and trodden out the mills. Uh, next slide is just a close reading of um, uh, these poems. Uh, Dickinson's idea of a brain swerving is powerful and resonant. What has run evenly runs evenly no more. Something she calls it a splinter gets in the way of the circuitry, no longer stationed in what she called its groove. The brain is operating on a different wavelength. The hills are slit. We might say the sulci and the gyri are being reformed. And once the unleashing of this new current happens, the brain can't go back to its original place. That's gone. This image strikes me as a beautiful representation of what happens when something in the brain, say a protein, causes a swerve that begins a flood of accumulation, whether tau or amyloid, thoroughly this is not Dickinson, that refuses to stay in place. This can be cause for great alarm and sadness and can also be the source of creative artistic potential. No wonder neurologists like literature professors are drawn to Dickinson. Next slide, please. I just thought I would share some of the images in the book. Um, one of the goals Bruce and I had was uh, to give readers um, the, the words that they might hear when they go to the doctor's office or the neurologist's office and have readers not hear them for the first time. So we really wanted to um, educate readers in the, in the language of neurology. And Carolyn Priolo made this beautiful um, image inspired by Magritte's Hegel's Holiday, uh, which is the umbrella um, with a glass of water on the top. Um, and this just gives readers an understanding that dementia is the larger category under which these other diseases go. And there are many other diseases that we don't include, um, but you'll see Lewy bodies, um, Alzheimer's, frontotemporal dementia, et cetera. Next slide, please. Again, um, we included this slide so that when doctors talk to their patients about the temporal lobe or the parietal lobe or the hippocampus or the amygdala, um, uh, readers, families um, will be familiar with this language um, and be equipped to ask the doctor questions knowing what some of these words mean. Next slide, please. Just another example of um, our uh, efforts to share Bruce's expertise in particular. Um, and these are the three variants of primary progressive aphasia. Um, and my father suffered from the logopenic variant of PPA. Um, and there's a way that you can um, uh, know exactly where the brain is getting hit by being able to, um, to, to diagnose what kind of aphasia the person is suffering from. Next slide, please. Um, this is maybe um, a bit redundant, but um, uh, one of my goals was to support readers with information and some of the things I learned as a Global Brain Health Institute fellow, uh, I learned that there was a prodromal stage of the disease that sometimes decades before you get a diagnosis, there are signs that there's a problem. Um, my father did have hearing and sleeping issues. Um, would that we had known that these could potentially be um, signifying a cognitive problem. 
mood changes. Um, uh, I learned that some of the medication that my father was given was really bad for him. Um, that some of the medications actually made his symptoms worse. Um, I learned about the brain body connection, uh, the importance of cognitive reserve. And again, I think that um, possessing information and some of the language used by neurologists can be incredibly empowering. Next slide, please. Coming to the end here. Um, these are the chapters in the book. Um, it begins with a diagnosis chapter and ends with a memory chapter. Um, Bruce was an amazing interlocutor and a wonderful literary critic. I would tell him stories and he would say that needs to be a chapter. I told him a story about my mom taking my dad to a hearing doctor decades before the diagnosis. His hearing was quote unquote fine. The doctor asked my mother how long they had been married. She said over 25 years, he said, the doctor said, your husband just doesn't want to listen to you anymore. And Bruce said that needs to go into a chapter and that became the kernel for a chapter on diagnosis. Um, there's a chapter on word finding, space, behavior, and as I said, memory. And I'm gonna end with reading uh, one more excerpt. So next slide, please. And this was one of the first things I wrote. This was about language and word finding. And I'll just read mine. Uh, Bruce gives a response, um, uh, uh, but I'm gonna end because I wanna save room for Elsbeth and questions. It was a beautiful spring day in Berkeley and that evening we were going to make dinner at my house. Dad wanted a salad with his chicken. This seemed like a rather straightforward proposition until we got closer to the market and dad realized he wanted something very specific in his salad but couldn't remember what it was. I was always good with words, having been trained in the arts of playing Scrabble at a very young age with a very competitive mother, and then spending hours on the New York Times crossword puzzle as a college student pre-Google. I was therefore confident that I could help dad get to the right word with little fuss. Cocky, rational me went into problem-solving mode. Initially, I thought he wanted a certain kind of lettuce and not just iceberg. Um, we were in Berkeley, after all, and dad had succumbed to the charms of the gourmet ghetto with its gorgeous produce and cheese varieties. Arugula, no. Red leaf, no. He made it clear that it wasn't lettuce that he wanted, but it was something in the salad. Goat cheese, no. Tomatoes, no. Chickpeas, no. Sprouts, no. I was starting to get a little antsy myself as I realized I wasn't hitting my mark. Dad picked up his pace as if speed would help him find the word more quickly, as if the word were running away from him and walking faster would help him catch it. I suggested that we might be able to figure out what it was that he wanted once we got to the market and we could go through the aisles. For some reason, I was set on the idea that it was chickpeas that he wanted, but he just wasn't connecting the word to the thing. Thus, I gently directed us toward the beans. Bad move. He got angry not only because he didn't want chickpeas, but also because he realized that I was behaving as if I thought he didn't know what the word chickpea referred to. He was right to be angry, and I was right to treat him like a child because he was one sort of. I now see his anger as a good thing. He was angry that I was treating him like a child and he was healthy enough to know it. As the disease progressed, I came to miss that anger because it had confirmed for me that some structures remained in place. He was still my father and I his child. Absent the anger, that was gone. He was gone too, and so was I. Next slide, please. I regrouped us and we walked toward the produce aisle. He told me it wasn't anything like that, as in nothing refrigerated. What the fuck was it? Capers? I didn't think he liked capers, but the past was pretty irrelevant, as I also thought he knew the woman to whom he had been married for over 30 years. At a certain point, my dad's desperation became my own. No longer were we walking through the various aisles, which was another one of my initial strategies, saunter through the aisle and maybe he'll see what he wants and that will be that. Considering other things he, we might have wanted with dinner. It was all about finding whatever it was that we were looking for, our white whale. Who knew it was croutons? 
The two of us began a frantic search through the aisles. With fear and hope, I watched my dad looking at the various cans and boxes of stuff on the shelves, his expression turning from hope to disappointment to sadness and back again, with each swift rejection of not seeing the thing he could not name. I decided it would be worse for me to keep guessing, so I shut my mouth and just kept him company on his heartbreaking journey through the supermarket. Eventually, we found the croutons. Dad's face lit up. He was so incredibly happy. I could have cried for joy myself. It was over. The relief was physical. Our hunt through the oceans of salad paraphernalia was over. We could go home, make the damn salad, and eat. Until my dad decided that he wanted to rent a movie. I'll cut to the chase and tell you it was Ferris Bueller's day off, but my dad couldn't, didn't, couldn't find the words, and so we started all over again. Next slide. And then Bruce writes about um, why the word crouton um, would have been more difficult um, for my father to access than say a word like mom or dad or blue or red. Um, and then the next slide, please. And that's the end of my presentation. Um, thank you very much. Cindy, thank you so much. And I know uh, everybody listening will be like me, very moved by this very personal glimpse of your family's life and your father's condition in the context of your wider professional life. And before we move on to hear from Ellie, I'd, I'd really like to take a couple of minutes just to reflect on some of the things that you've talked about, because they have struck a chord, I think, certainly with me uh, as a, a fellow professor of literature, um, but uh, um, one of the things that I think everybody will be interested in is the way this book uh, has memory so centrally positioned um, and stranded throughout the chapters. And it strikes me that I, I'm reminded of, of Virginia Woolf saying, you know, that she used memory to bring her parents back again. Um, could you talk a bit about what you think the motive was for you in, in the kind of detail you recover about your father? Is it solace? Is it to bring him back almost physically? Or was it as a kind of pathway to understanding what you talked about, that narrative route that his condition took? Mm, that's uh, such a good question. Um, you know, an author's intention is always a tricky thing, right? Um, so I, I think I started out thinking I was doing one thing and then coming out on the other side, I realized I was doing something else. So I begun the project really because I had compartmentalized my life so much in order to complete my dissertation um, and be the English professor I wanted to be that my parents had always wanted me to be. I had to cordon off um, uh, my literary life, uh, my professional life from what my family was experiencing and what my father was experiencing. But there was leakage for sure. And the leakage was in the novels that I was really drawn to. Um, especially Moby Dick, um, which is fundamentally um, about grief. I mean, it's about so much more, right? But it's really, um, you know, Ishmael has the hypos, so he goes to the sea, um, and and Ahab is grieving, and Pip is grieving, and so um, there were sort of windows into my personal grief. Um, with respect to the stories that I was reading, but I worked really hard to keep them separate. And I think I wanted to write this book to kind of bring the two halves of myself together and more importantly, um, to come to terms as best as I could with what my father was experiencing. And what was so strange is um, the literature helped a, a little, but it also got in the way. Um, uh, the literature, I was in a hall of mirrors and my grief just kept replicating itself. And I don't know, maybe because I'm a Caltech and 
people around here don't organize their lives in terms of the Scarlet Letter and Virginia Woolf, um, I thought, well, maybe science will help. I just had this intuition. And once I started learning neurology and getting this whole other vocabulary, it helped me get out of my way and get more in touch with my father and mm. his brain and what he was experiencing. And so that goal of understanding what my father was experiencing and, and trying to sort of recover from this intense compartmentalization that I had to do to get my degree, that was what I wanted um, from the book. And then I also then wanted to help readers um, who were going through the experience and people with dementia. And then, as you so beautifully put it, bring my father back to life. Um, my healthy father, the father that I had for 25 years before that day my mother called me, I was reading Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, preparing for my orals, and my mother told me dad had Alzheimer's. And it's like time stopped, which is also very Virginia Woolf. <laughs> um, and I needed to get back to the time before that. And so there were a lot of motivations and it changed over the course of writing the book. And, and that journey that you've talked about, it, it, it chimes with a question that's come in. We, we'll just take one now, but it's from Rosemary Blanco, who says, how on earth did you go about finding someone like Bruce? How do you begin to work with a medical professional? And I, I, I just add to that because it was so interesting in your talk about the coming together of three worlds, the world, obviously, of, of Alzheimer's, your world as a a literature professor, and then the world of science. Um, and the collision of these, these three worlds can't have been easy. Um, right. I'm wondering, in addition to, to Rose's question, having found Bruce, were there times when it was frustrating and difficult to be speaking a different language? I'm thinking, for example, you know, you talked about the, the close reading skills that a literature scholar has, but there's a world of difference, perhaps, where, you know, we might talk about interpretation and a neurologist might use the word diagnosis. Right. You know, how did you go about bridging this kind yeah. of language discrepancy? Yeah. So I love to be a student and getting to be in the Global Brain Health Institute. Um, you know, I got to sit in class. Um, I got to um, uh, listen in uh, with the patient's permission on genetic counseling, um, uh, people taking the, the memory tests. Um, and on the one hand, you're right. I mean, the, the discourse is completely different. Um, I'm kind of used to that being at Caltech. Uh, where I often find myself in seminars basically Googling every other word that someone says because I don't know what it means. Um, so that was actually oddly familiar. Um, but I think that there is an interesting overlap. I mean, narrative medicine is a place for overlap. But also, uh, one thing that blew my mind Maybe the only thing Bruce was wrong about, he told me by the end of the year, I would know how to read a, a MRI and a PET scan. And uh, I would sit in a room with a bunch of radiologists and they would have an image of a brain and people would be like, oh, so do you see the atrophy over here? Or do you see how, you know, the matter here is not looking the way it's supposed to look? And they were doing close readings of images. Um, I never quite got my head around how to do that. Um, but I think that that the um, the the doctors um, were engaged in an act of close reading, but it was images and cells and gray matter, you know, rather than words. And so um, that's my interpretation, uh, but that's how I kind of created a, a connection. And I say, I should also say that um, 
you know, UCSF and Trinity, because Trinity is the other location for the GBHI program, um, are especially hospitable to this interdisciplinarity. I, um, I think there are other um, universities that welcome uh, that kind of interdisciplinary thinking, probably not enough, um, but it was kind of the gold standard um, for yeah. an English professor, you know, finding herself in a world of neurologists. It was really just tremendous. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's it's interesting how many questions are coming in now. We'll not get to them all. How many questions are focusing on language itself? Alison County is is commenting that, you know, is, is the idea of learning a new language a way to understanding and articulating the imagination? And Mary Rafferty, who, who gives us some information about these conditions and particularly of, of aphasia, uh, asks about how you responded to the progressive nature of the loss of language. And I know we're, we're short of time, but I wonder if you could just speak to that briefly, Cindy, because it was on my mind as well. You know, we again, to cross over to the creative imagination, we're yeah. used to writers, poets searching for language, searching for words. Right. You know, and there you are talking about your father in that right. wonderful piece you read at the end, oh, searching you. for words. Yeah. Um, so, you know, could you see this through a professional lens or was it just too acutely distressing and too personal? Um, so, you know, the fact that it took me decades to write this book suggests that... Um, <laughs> this is going to sound harder on myself than I mean it to, but like I did a really lousy job. <laughs> I did the best job I could at the time in my 20s. Um, but um, I, you know, I've already talked about compartmentalizing, but just sort of the, the degree of repression um, was just so profound that, um, I mean, the pain was just so extraordinary that I, I write in the book that if I had looked directly at what my father was experiencing, I would have gone blind. It would be like looking at an eclipse, you know, it would be just, I, I just couldn't do it. And so literature and art helped me hide. Um, so it was, it, it was a, you know, in today's parlance, a safe space, but, but then it wasn't because um, it was um, just sort of um, a temporary place to hide. And, yes. um, you know, I don't know if that answers your question, but um, I, I think uh, partly I'm sure Freud would have something to say about this, but like, that's why I was so productive. Like I just took all of the sadness and all of the grief and, you know, all of the stuff about language and poured it into creating language and books of my own until I could write this one for my dad. But I might just ask you to, to say a bit more about this idea of the imaginary worlds from your perspective, not only as a literature scholar, but in terms of what you saw of your father's decline. Uh, one of the, um, I suppose, linguistic refuges that we always turn to when people have neurological conditions is the idea that they're in another world. Or uh, as you know, we might say, as Yeats would have written, away with the fairies. You know, they've gone somewhere else, even though they're physically present. So the idea of that imaginative world is not always perhaps as, as positive uh, as we might want it to be. How much a wonder do you find that kind of thinking a problem in, in talking about your own experience? And how much of it was a, a, a benefit or a useful device to think that your father was in his own other world? Great question. Um, I guess the first thing I would say is that when my dad was sick, um, it was in the 80s and 90s. And there was a profound lack of imagination at the time. 
in terms of um, how to deal with people with dementia. And I have to say, it always unnerves me when people say there's a lot of resonance between what I describe and what they experience, because I wish that were not the case. Um, but I think where things are different is in the creative ways people are thinking about interacting with people with dementia. Um, and Basting, for example, has um, uh, this book called like Forget Memory. Like, who cares? You know, like, irrelevant um and so she goes to like these senior residents homes and they put on these plays and that's where the the slide about dementia and narrative comes in and you know there there are things that as literature faculty we know from beckett you know like the the narratives everything's up for grabs uh in this potentially really productive way and happy making way. And one of the things I loved about being a, um, a fellow at UCSF was there were a lot of creative thinkers. This is kind of an elliptical way of answering your question, but um, like people working on dance um, with people with dementia. And there's all this research now about the power of music um, to access parts of the brain that are having difficulty with language. So like Tony Bennett, the you know famous case, he may not be able to have a conversation, but ask him to sing one of his hit songs and like the words just are right there. So bringing imagination and creativity to the caregiving of people with dementia is, uh, just so valuable and so important. And, you know, what you were saying um, earlier about occupying a different world, uh, one of the, one of the um, hardest class meetings for me was seeing a video of this nurse with a bunch of people with dementia, like from the 1960s. And during that time, like, um, you didn't want that person to go off into their own world. And so if their mother died and they forgot, the nurse is like saying, your mother is not going to be visiting you, Mrs. X, because she died. And then the person with dementia, it's like hearing that for the first time, experiencing her mother's death all over again, only to forget it 10 minutes later. And so there's, um, I think, a lot of progress on, it's not about lying or telling the truth. It's just trying to occupy this world that the person with dementia is in, as long as it's not harmful in any way. Um, so there's that. And then the other way to answer the question is, I think um, every person's experience of dementia is really different. And so, you know, my father was so over-medicated. Um, was, he was turned into a zombie. I mean, if he was occupying anyone's world, it was William Burroughs's world. You know, um, it 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 wasn't a fun place. I I can say that with absolute confidence. Um, but but I I um, I think that um, there's just a lot more openness now to. Um, as a caregiver, um, doing what you can to enter this alternate universe mm. that the person might be in. And I think that that's a positive. Mm. And, and I suppose might be taken as, as just the fundamental ethos of democracy itself, that ability right. to imagine the condition of the other, right. Right. Um, imagine the condition of those who aren't in our shoes, which of course is so difficult to do when right. you have such a distressing situation and it's, you know, it's a family member and someone close to you. Um, and yet they are now in their own way alien to you. And I think it's right. um it's very moving the way you've talked about this need to 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 cross that bridge 
Um, and I, I'm really struck, Cindy, by how often you reach for literary resources yeah. for, for novels and texts, and indeed Ellie, you as well, you know, that we understand so many of these stories because we have read them in literature. And I'm, I'm really impressed about how you bring that world, that, you know, those imaginary worlds into your repertoire for understanding the experience that your family has gone through. But it, it's, it brings me to a question I don't want to ignore because it's such a good one. And we might move to a close with this uh, from Claudia, who says, thank you very much for this moving talk. Uh, I was wondering, did the process give your co-writer, that's Bruce Miller, new insight too from your perspective? Do you think that Bruce crossed enough into your world? You had to go into the world of neuroscience and its languages. But did he, do you think he crossed into your territory? Uh, he says he did, and mm. I will believe him. Uh, uh, it's funny, we, uh, when we first met, we completely hit it off and had totally different uh, tastes in literature. So that was kind of funny. He um, is a big fan of Thomas Pynchon, uh, and I am less so. And he suggested that I read Inherent Vice, um, which I dutifully went home and read, and it was about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And I thought to myself, why is he, why is he telling me to read this book? What is it about me that he thinks I should be reading this? But um, uh, uh, he talks a lot about the importance of reading in his childhood. And he, most importantly, I don't want to be glib. He said that in writing this book with me, he has an understanding of what families go through in a way that he hadn't fully embraced before. So um, I think I found the right words for him to mm -hmm. understand the pain of going through this. And he's an incredibly empathic human being. It's hard to imagine his empathy meter getting any higher, but, um, but I think it did. Thank you, Cindy. And with just so many people now um, putting questions in or comments in which show how much your talk this evening has really struck a chord with people um, and indeed people who uh, I suspect some of them are going through similar experiences with family members um, and uh, to everyone who has put in questions that we haven't got to or comments or uh, their own experiences uh, rest assured we we will look at all of those and Cindy I know will um, will respond to them as best she can but I think um, the, the response from the online audience shows just how special this talk has been and how generous, um, Cindy, you've been with your experience and your emotions and also your professional skills in, in opening this world to us. Um, so I, I'm going to draw things to a close, uh, but let me first um, thank uh, Cindy for just such a, a wonderful and powerful contribution to Creative yeah. Brain Week. Um, I want to thank Ellie Payne for adding uh, a dimension that we do need to think about as well, our democratic imagination and our responsibility to a kind of creative input into that because uh, we lose it at our peril. Um, I want to thank the Trinity Long Room Hub team, particularly Christina, who've worked so hard to make sure we could bring this talk to everybody um, and to the Creative Brain team, uh, who've just been wonderful in their programming, um, Dominic, B, and all your team, thank you so much. Uh, and most of all, to everyone who's joined us tonight and has listened, those of you who've asked questions or put in your own thoughts and comments, uh, it's all been very welcome and it's made this session tremendously rich for me uh, and I hope that everybody um, has enjoyed it and uh, and has taken away something from it. Um, so on that note, Cindy, I hope that in the future you will be with us in person to talk more about uh, both this book and your new project on uh, The Surreal, which sounds absolutely fascinating. I wish you the best of luck with that. Uh, and Ellie and I will be very pleased to meet you when you can join us in Dublin 
in person. So on that note, I'll draw things to a close. I'll wish everybody uh, listening this evening uh, a good night. And we hope to see you again uh, for the Trinity Long Room Hub events in the near future. Good night, everybody.